Trinidad and Tobago and remain standing for the prayer. Almighty God, the creator of the universe, we thank you for the blessing of yet another initiative for the development of our nation. We thank you for the opportunity to develop the youths of the nation, because as we say, train up a child in the way that they should go, and in so doing, the seeds planted will improve the quality of life of our citizens. We are ever mindful of the fact that you have blessed us with so much. Even in the midst of this uncertain, changing global and socioeconomic climate, you have given our leaders the ability to focus and logically steer the path of progress with stability. We invite your blessings today as we come together to discuss the matters within the education sector since there is nothing that we can achieve without you. This supplication is for the advancement of your glory and the trust and welfare of our blessed land. Grant safety and development for these projects and all its users for generations to come. Amen, Amin, Namaste. Please be seated. Dr. the Honorable Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. the Honorable Nian Gadsby Dolly, Minister of Education, other members of cabinet. The Honorable Ansel Dennis, Chief Secretary, Tobago House of Assembly. Your Worship, the Mayor of Port of Spain, Alderman Joel Martinez. The Honorable Lisa Morris Julian, Minister in the Ministry of Education. Senator the Honorable Hassel Backus, Minister in the Ministry of Public Administration and Digital Transformation, Members of Parliament. The Most Reverend Charles Jason Gordon, Archbishop of Port of Spain, Ms. Lenore Batiste Simmons, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Education. Ms. Lisa Henry David, Chief Education Officer, Acting, Staff of the Ministry of Education, valued stakeholders in education, specially invited guests, members of the media, our viewing and listening audience, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the Spotlight on Education. I am your host and moderator for the evening. My name is Sharon Pitt. To formally welcome you, and to bring opening remarks, please welcome to the podium the Honorable Lisa Morris Julian, Minister in the Ministry of Education.
Good evening. Tonight, I truly count it an honor and privilege to be given the humble task of welcoming you to yet another spotlight in education, the transformation of education, a national conversation led by the Ministry of Education under the leadership of our very own Minister of Education, Dr. The Honorable Gadsby Dolly. As Minister in the Ministry of Education, I also take this opportunity to welcome the driving force and the architect of this great vision for our nation's educational system, Dr. The Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Tonight, I want to thank all you viewing and listening members of the public for your continued valuable engagements. We have seen over the last few weeks that these conversations are pushing us to revisit explore, and even discover ways that will indeed transform education, not just how we teach, but also how we learn. Only by adapting, we will become a stronger nation, building and forging a better future. We cannot ignore the fact that 2020 has completely forced us out of our comfort zone as it pertains to our educational system. Additionally, the COVID-19 pandemic has challenged us to make major changes permanent adjustments, a new normal. We have seen signs of pandemic fatigue in our children and our teachers. We have been forced to isolate, to maintain social distancing, and at times to mask our smiles. Yet, we have also seen the best in us. We have seen the very best in rising to this occasion. We are evolving, we are evolving for the better as we continue to prove to ourselves that we are a resilient and creative people. If a butterfly had the power of speech, she would say that her time in the cocoon was difficult, even painful, but a necessary part of her transformation, because without it, she would not have grown wings, and she would not be able to fly. I believe that we as citizens have to fly to even higher heights while tackling the difficult issues. I want to once again thank our hardworking permanent secretaries, our staff members of this ministry, that have gone way and beyond the call of duty at every consultation, virtual town meeting, and spotlight. Without you, our national view in public, and the passionate stakeholders of our education system, this project would not be possible. So again, welcome, and may tonight's experience and contributions continue to add value to our national conversation. As my minister says, no child will be left behind. Let us work together to make this into a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much for your opening remarks, the Honorable Lisa Morris Julian. And now to give her presentation, I welcome to the microphone education specialist, Dr. Freddie James. Please welcome her. Thank you. Dr. The Honorable Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. The Honorable Nyan Gatsby Dolly, Minister of Education. Other members of Cabinet. The Honorable Ansel Dennis, Chief Secretary, Tobago House of Assembly. His Worship, the Mayor of Port of Spain, Alderman Joel Martinez. The Honorable Lisa Morris Julian, Minister in the Ministry of Education. Senator Hassel Bacchus, Minister in the Ministry of Public Administration and Digital Transformation. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, good evening. I take great pleasure in having been asked to share my thoughts and views on education transformation in Trinidad and Tobago, something about which I'm very passionate. 
I grew up with a father who was an avid gardener. As a little girl, I would sit on a bench he built for me on afternoons and watch, what, watch him create what for me was magic. The magic was the transformation that I saw take place slowly from seed to produce that made its way into our kitchen and eventually into our bellies. Nevertheless, the transformation didn't happen just so. And I took note, and now, I, as I reflect as an adult, I understand that what my father was teaching me while I sat on that bench was a way of life, an understanding of how we ought to behave in life if we want to grow and if we want to know. The transformation occurred because of four key deliberate actions. One, my father created an environment in which the plant could thrive. And I noted that not all environments were suited for all plants, and that unless the seed was put into the right environment, it would not bear fruit. This taught me purpose. The growth process required sustained commitment, supervision, care, and monitoring. Wetting and mulching, fertilizing where necessary, and so on. Thirdly, my father knew what he was doing. He was quite confident. He knew how to move the seed to produce. He was competent. If he wasn't sure about anything, he had his gardener friends with whom he would consult and collaborate, and he would also do his research. Fourthly, my father operated from a position of love. You only had to see him come alive when he was tending to, tending to his plants. When it came to taking care of them, he left nothing untouched. He was most concerned about the plant that seemed weak, and he was determined to do all in his power to ensure that these particular plants succeeded. Education transformation is much like doing great gardening like my father did. It is about unlocking value. The outcome is to grow our children into productive, functional, global citizens. It means creating and implementing policies and practices along the lines of or undergirded by inclusivity, differentiation, and equity that ensure that all students, like the plants, are placed in an environment in which they can thrive and their value can be realized and honed. It therefore cannot be a one-size-fits-all approach. This is one reason why we need transformation. Another key reason why we need transformation is because we are preparing students for the future for a future that is uncertain and with social and cultural issues that we don't even know about. We therefore must be predictive. The question I'm sure you all are asking yourselves is, well, how do we do it? In this short time that I've been allotted, I will offer a few ideas. If we really want to transform education, we must focus on making schools places of belonging for all our stakeholders. I'm going to repeat that, because this is the thesis of my presentation. And this is the crux of the matter. This is where the box stops. We must, if we really want to transform education, we have to focus on making schools places of belonging for all our stakeholders. 
This philosophy must undergird all that we do. It is simple. If people feel they belong, they feel valued. If they feel valued, they and those they work with have high expectations of each other and are therefore inclined to work together to meet those expectations. We therefore need to innovate. And on this matter of innovation, I know it's a word that is bandied around quite a lot, but on the matter of innovation, I will address three key issues that relate to any sort of educational transformation or that would drive real educational transformation. The three innovative dimensions are one, strengthen the pedagogical core. We must innovate the pedagogical core. And the core elements are the learners, the educators, the content, the learning resources. But that's not sufficient. We also have to address the matter of the dynamics that connect those elements pedagogy and formative evaluation, the use of time, and the organization of educators and learners. The second key innovative dimension is leadership. Leadership must not just be proactive. Leadership must be predictive and become formative organizations with strong learning leadership, strong design with vision and strategies, and constantly informed by self-review and evidence on learning achieved. So the focus is on learning, and the focus is on reflecting on self and organization. The third innovative dimension I would mention is open up to partnerships. Not just to collaborate, but to open up to partnerships. For example, create synergies and find ways to enhance professional, social, and cultural capital with the others. Do this with families, communities, higher education, cultural institutions, businesses, and especially other schools and learning environments. I know a lot of talk is, is taking place about curriculum change, and I will touch on this very slightly. I want to point out some four key areas that relate to curriculum change. And these relate to the key outcomes of curriculum change. So as we engage in this discourse, on curriculum change, let us engage with a purpose and let us know what we want at the end of it. Curriculum change refers to any conscious, deliberate attempt to engender change in the curriculum of a school or school system which should produce four key outcomes. One, a new structure. Two, new teaching practices. Three, new curriculum materials. Four, change in beliefs or understandings. Thus, while curriculum change can be beneficial, its benefits are not a given, since they depend on a confluence of, of factors coming together. But above all, I wanted to make this point, and I want to make it very clear. Systems and structures do not in and of themselves bring about change. It is people who do so. Therefore, the most important outcome of curriculum change, if we are to have transformation, is changing beliefs and understandings of stakeholders. In other words, we need cultural change. I know people like to refer to countries like Finland and Singapore to benchmark high-performing education systems. But we must remember that in these contexts, educators are highly valued, and there's an embedded culture of adapting 
and most importantly, understanding the notion of failing fast and failing forward. I say any kind of learning involves three key areas. One, collaboration. Two, the road is not going to be easy. And chances are you will fail before you succeed. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take that journey. And the third area, and, and you know, you can probably say it's the most, one of the most important areas, is research. You have to know what to do, how to do it, why you do it. And therefore, you have to answer those key questions. You have to know the what, the so what, and the now what. Transformation rests within that now what area. It's not sufficient to just know. It's not sufficient for me to come here and just espouse theory and that kind of thing for you. We have to be on all committed to the journey of where, what now? What are we going to do now? I leave you with this. Well, before I leave you with this, leadership is critical to achieving any form of transformation. In the educational context, the transformation we are looking for in particular is the transformation in learning, learning at all levels, but key student learning, and where transformation is the goal, and improving student learning is the outcome, teacher quality is one of the most significant factors to improve student learning and to transform any society. I leave you with this. Let us all, as education stakeholders, ask and answer honestly the question, is the work I am doing having the impact that it should? Once you have asked and answered that question, then let's take action. Education transformation is a call to action. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Dr. Freddie James, for your interesting insights into what is needed for transforming education with the innovative uh, dimensions you mentioned. And now we are delighted to bring another presentation from Senator, the Honorable Hassel Bacchus, Minister in the Ministry of Public Administration and digital transformation. Please welcome him to the podium. Dr. The Honorable Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. The Honorable Nayan Gaspi Dolly, Minister of Education, other cabinet ministers. The Honorable Ansel Dennis, Chief Secretary of the Tobago House of Assembly. His Worship, the Mayor of Port of Spain, Alderman Joel Martinez. The Honorable Lisa Morris Julian, Minister in the Ministry of Education. Members of Parliament. The Most Reverend Charles Jason Gordon, Archbishop of Port of Spain, Ms. Lenore Batiste Simmons, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Education, Ms. Lisa Henry David, Chief Education Officer Acting, Staff of the Ministry of Education, Valued Stakeholders, Specially Invited Guests, 
members of the media, the viewing audience and the listening audience, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all, good evening. Transforming education. Usually when I am asked to deliver any type of, of, of feature, it's normally about all technology. But I have to marry two things today. Let me remove this. Transformation is primarily three things. People, process, technology. You could add resources and things behind that. But ultimately, it's about people. And transformation in the main changes a couple of things. One that people see very obviously, it changes how you do things. But the piece that is a bit more obscure and I think puts people off a bit is the fact that it also changes what you do. When we talk about people and the transformation of people, if we're talking about in the education system, we're talking about students, parents, teachers, people within the upper levels of the, the Ministry in Education, school supervisors, people who evaluate the performance and so on. But it is interesting to note that the involvement of technology in the process of, of education is something that has been happening for a long time. Those of you who would be old enough to remember would know, I was in primary school at least when it happened, when at two o'clock in the afternoon, two large standard five boys will go up and lift a big radio down from the principal's office, bring it downstairs and turn it on, and we would listen to our BBC program. In effect at the time, distance learning. We've come a long way since then. In 2010, a large study was undertaken, looking back all the way from 2003 coming forward, looking at whether or not online type teaching was as effective as in-person teaching. And at that time, even with those tools, the determination was yes. So even then, it was effective. But the reason why it was pursued at that time, and it turned out to be fortuitous, is that one, it seemed to be more, more efficient. Even though it was as effective, it was more efficient. So that was one good thing. But more than that, it created an avenue for learning where face-to-face -face interventions were impossible. I am not sure they envisaged COVID at the time, but it is directly applicable to where we are today. The other thing about education and technology and what it affords is that it's a global thing. The, there's an illustration from a 14th century a guy that put something together from medieval Italy and showed a depiction of a classroom with someone on a podium and students inside of it. This is in the 14th century. And if you looked at what was, what was illustrated in it, the students, you could see some paying attention, some chatting, some not paying attention, some asleep. It seems that even at this, even at this time, a lot of, of, of what was depicted here still was happening. But once you added the technology, to what we were trying to do in terms of enhancing the learning experience. We found ourselves in a, in a, a fairly, in murky waters. And I'll give an example. Let me give you an end-to-end -end transformation. In a technology-enhanced learning experience, before class starts, the environment would all have already been created where content is there. There are numerous ways for the educator to add that content to what is a solution that is helping to deliver it. You would have had an industry in terms of the people, the publishers and owners of the content of textbooks that would have been made available already online. There would have been an enterprise agreement, for example, with large purchasers of books like the state, 
who would then have a license to use it. Why is that so important? It's very difficult to lose a textbook online or to have your bag stolen with your textbook online or to walk in the rain and all, it gets ruined online. So it gives you a persistence and a consistency of that. So the teacher has it there and it's all built into the solution and is now available for distribution. Well, there has to be an underlying infrastructure that supports that. And a lot of the initiatives coming out of the Ministry of Education, supported by the Ministry of Public Administration, Digital Transformation, and its agencies and others, including the private sector and the service providers, seeking to provide global coverage for broadband communication. So now you have a vehicle on which it can reach The same ministries and so on are partnering with other people, again, with the private sector and so on involved, to ensure that the correct and applicable devices are available to the students to use it. But this is the people piece. The teacher, education professional, sets out what would be part of a redefined online curriculum. It's not the same thing that we would have done face to face. It's redefined and it's different. The delivery mechanism is different, the absorption is different. You put that together and you say, okay, we're going to do this, this exercise is what we're going to do and you deliver it via that same solution. Solution must be strong. It must be able to handle the number of people that are going to use it. It must be secure so that people don't get into it and do bad things. It must be always available. But again, to the people, you issue exercises to the class to be done, students within the class. The solution should identify to every student that they have an exercise to complete. The solution should monitor whether those exercises are being completed or not. The solution should inform the student with some level of cadence if they have not informed it that they haven't completed it that they should. It should inform the parent that the student had this work to do and has not done it. It should inform the teacher that this has to be done. Let's assume we have really good students that all completed everything. The solution should correct it. The solution should provide a report to the teacher that says of the 10 questions that were given 75% of the class did all of it, but let's say 100% did it, one. Two, it should say the question most correctly answered was this, or the questions most correctly answered were this. The ones that were most incorrectly answered were these. What does that do to the educator? Well, it says maybe I need to put some focus here. Or only two students did not do very well in it. Maybe they need some remedial work. You can ask and provide additional work through the system. The system should be available when offline so that students can work even when internet or when your broadband connection doesn't work. In a blended learning environment, the enabling piece that is underneath should identify. Well, if we're going to do blended learning, it means that we're going to have online education occurring in the schools. Do we have the appropriate infrastructure sitting in there? How should it change? All of these are questions that have to be answered and questions that we have to address in terms of how we're doing it. And they are being addressed. But they form part of how we are going to make this transformation work. The example I gave showed a couple things, but one of the things that it should have shown is that the transactional nature of some of the things that teachers have to do can be absorbed by technology. And teachers can then focus on the key thing that they have to do, which is teach. Transformation is about people. One of the things, last couple of things I want to talk about is the pros and cons in technology of education. People think that the technology can excite young students. The con to that is that people think it can also be a distraction to young students. People say, well, 
it can prepare students for the future. You start at, all the way down at kindergarten and work your way up. Students are accustomed to it. Some say, well, yeah, but if you get too into that, it removes opportunities for socialization and social development. It discourages creativity because one of the things that these technologies do is it provides all the information at your, at your, at your hands. So there are a number of things that we have to consider as we move forward with the implementation of technology within the, the learning environments. And of course, remember, not all learning environments are the same. You lecture more or less at university, you teach uh, at the primary school level, there's a blended piece of that in between. And the solutions and technologies you use must be able to account for that. In conclusion, there's no real reason to be afraid of technology in education. It's here to help. And while we have to enhance this and the, the accelerated pace at which we're doing it, and COVID is a, is a good reason why we have to do that, we're not rushing blindly into the transformation. Forums like this, the, the widespread consultations, the numerous committees that I know are working to the, attest to the fact that we are taking the time to do the necessary things to get this right. After all, education is about learning, and we should all be open to the ongoing processes and improvements that that can provide, that can be provided by technology. I thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Backus, uh, for that very interesting and uh, very exciting view of the transformation of education using uh, digital education. And as obviously has been made aware to all of us, this would take a very strong leadership and it is a huge task. Fortunately, our Minister of Education Dr. the Honorable Nian Gadsby Dolly has a remarkable track record of being passionate about youth motivation and success and youth development. And so when you speak of leadership being critical, I think we can rest assured that that leadership is available to us. Please welcome now to address us Dr. the Honorable Nian Gadsby Dolly. Dr. The Honorable Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Cabinet colleagues, His Worship the Mayor of Port of Spain, Alderman Joel Martinez, The Honorable Ansel Dennis, Chief Secretary of the THE, The Honorable Lisa Morris Julian, Minister in the Ministry of Education, The Honorable Hassel Bacchus, Minister in the Ministry of Public Administration and Digital Transformation, Members of Parliament, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Education, Lenore Batiste Simmons, Lisa Henry David, CEO Acting of the Ministry of Education, Dr. Freddie James, Panelists, Stakeholders in Education, Specially Invited Guests, Members of the Media, Members of the Viewing and Listening Audience, Good evening to you all. I begin with a quote. If you do not know where you come from, then you do not know where you are. And if you don't know where you are, then you don't know where you're going. And if you don't know where you're going, you're probably going wrong. This evening, as we focus our discussions on transforming education, 
it is imperative that we understand where we are, where we were, and where we want to be. The theme of transforming education, which has been guiding the Ministry of Education since August 2020, was conceived by our feature speaker this evening, none other than the Honorable Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. The term transforming speaks to an ongoing action. Note well, it is not transformation as it is understood that education in its broadest sense is ever-changing and dynamic. The court used to open my contribution this evening speaks to where we are in education. We are at a crossroad of understanding as every other ministry of education is in the world. How do we transform this sector to meet the needs of learners in 2020 and beyond? What mechanisms must be put in place to support all stakeholders in education, students, parents, teachers, and administrators? How can we, together, create the most encompassing and inclusive education system for the people of Trinidad and Tobago? How can we assure the quality of education on the virtual platform? How can avenues be created for corporate Trinidad and Tobago, NGOs, and willing and qualified citizens to impact the lives of our children through the education system? In the face of all the changes the world is facing, the government views it as critical that our population has a say in how we discharge our responsibility to deliver to our future leaders, our children, their fundamental human right to education. The world has to reshape and rethink education. In this lies an opportunity that in Trinidad and Tobago we intend to capitalize on. Things that we thought impossible have been done. Processes which may have taken years to accomplish have been done in months. We have the opportunity to dissect, analyze, compare, retool, reshape. We have the opportunity to transform education. We have done a lot right over the years in education in Trinidad and Tobago. Sometimes we lose sight of this in our quest to improve. Even in difficult times, our children have the opportunity to be educated free of charge. Those who have not succeeded in their CSEC examinations have access to free tuition and free repeat examinations. Our young adults have access to GATE for their undergraduate studies and additional support is available from HELP Loans, the National Scholarship Program, and now the National Bursary Program. Vocational training is available for free, and in some cases, even with a stipend. And that's available through the MUST Program, HYPE, MIC, NESC, YTEP, the Community Skills Training Program of the Ministry of Sport and Community Development. And none of these things that I've mentioned here are new. The government also provides support to our public tertiary institutions so that even courses which are not presently funded by the GATE program are reasonably affordable to citizens. And even in difficult times, the national budget has maintained its share towards education sector. So though we as a country have more to do, much more to do in the quest to make quality education fully accessible, inclusive, and holistic. We must also celebrate our progress along this road, which really has no end, but winds through time and space, as does learning itself. Again, the term transforming encapsulates constant movement as we set ourselves goals to mark progressive steps very critical in the next few years, as critical as the incorporation of technology into the teaching and learning process, will be an accountability system for our schools. 
That system for Trinidad and Tobago exists on the same principles of the Each Student Success Act of 2015 of the United States. As obtains in countries with similar accountability systems in place, the goal will be to provide all children significant opportunity to receive a fair, equitable, and high quality education and to close educational achievement gaps. The well-off, the poor, the vulnerable, those at risk, those at potential, the strong, the weak, the child with special needs, the disciplined, the lazy, all our children must achieve, and we must make it so. The need for the institutionalization of an integrated mechanism to assure quality in education has already been clear in the comments coming through from the National Consultation on Education 2020. We must trace and track how our students are performing and be able to intervene where it is needed to close the achievement gaps. It is not enough to know. It is now time to act. It is time to intervene so that quality education can be achieved by all. In education, one size does not fit all. The consultations of 2020 provided a necessary forum for our population to discuss issues which have been long outstanding as well as those which have been made more critical from our 2020 experience, namely the conduct of the SEA, the secondary examin entrance examination, secondary entrance assessment, and the transition to secondary school, the Concordat, curricular reform, blended learning, the role of parents and guardians in education, the role of the Teaching Service Commission, and teacher training and development. Of course, even the format of this consultation was transformed. We went virtual with the discussion, and we are grateful for the enthusiastic participation of our citizenry. The virtual town halls concluded yesterday. However, citizens still have the opportunity to share their views until December the 4th by following the directions either on our website or on our Facebook page. Trinidad and Tobago, I must take this opportunity to recognize the corporate entities, NGOs, and individuals who have answered the call and have given human support to the students of our country through the Adopt-A-School program. It is a well-known fact that getting online has not been easy or simple for all students, and it continues to be a major challenge. It is for that very reason that the call was made and the country is heartened, even in these difficult and uncertain times, by the swift, certain response of our donors. Students across the country have been able to benefit directly from the donations of laptops, tablets, and internet connectivity that were made directly to their schools at a time when even getting devices into the country is a challenge. These efforts bear special mention as they encapsulate the village concept which must become as much a part of our education landscape as our masks have become a part of our wardrobe and daily routine. As we engage this evening, let us be mindful of who and what this discussion is really about. It is about our children and the future of Trinidad and Tobago. What we do in education and how we treat with and prepare our children for the future will create the pathway for the progress of Trinidad and Tobago. Let that responsibility never escape us as we forge ahead. Allow me as I close to echo the sentiment of our Honorable Prime Minister as I appeal to us to have a responsible Christmas season, thus giving our children 
who do need to return to face-to-face -face school, their best chance of regaining a sense of normalcy as soon as possible. May God bless us all. Thank you very much, Minister of Education, Dr. The Honorable Nian Gadsby Dolly. And uh, once again, for our viewers and listeners, we welcome you to this. Under the auspices of the Ministry of Education, transforming education, the spotlight is on education this evening. And in a, uh, our second half, we will be opening the floor for discussion and questions. So we look forward to your active engagement. At this time, we do invite a youngster, 12 years old, um, and she is a proponent of the spoken word. Please put your hands together for Aaliyah Curtin of St. George's College. This um, spoken word, this poem is called Swimming. COVID has taught some to enjoy family more. COVID has taught some that life isn't sure. COVID has taught some to survive as cupboards suffer from financial termites because food intake gets slim. As for me, COVID has taught me to swim. I learn how to freestyle, butterfly, tread and float. I learn how to swim without water, breast relay, and backstroke. Because ever since school went online, <laughs> I've been swimming in homework. <laughs> and it's not just me. It's like teachers actually didn't have Olympics in 2020. So teach the students are put to the test to see how athletic abilities applies in academics. Tidal wave of homework could wash away the pandemic. First is swim I swim in. Because who wants to perish in a sea of incapability? Not me. So I swim as I skim past each torrent they throw. And I swim for where I grew up. We know what it is to drown. And I frown at those who are not as strong as me. Forever song in my heart. The chorus is, I must succeed. And I need to teach my fellow students these songs because the current can't get strong in this new norm. Students need to strengthen their arms, work hard to conform, for we can't drown. Always in the mood for a flood, we can't drown. Love will help us get through. And for those who suffer in swimming, Trent Bago has lifeboats for you in the form of parental sacrifice. The ministry giving someone a new device. Principals giving us no homework days as a blind, or even the neighbor opening up their Wi Fi. No longer will we stand by. This is our swimming race, and our resilience is winning. We can't do it, Trinbago students. Watch how we synchronize swimming. Thank you. And that was 12-year-old Aaliyah Curtin with her spoken word piece. Transforming education is the running theme through the National Consultation on Education 2020. And it is the theme that takes it towards its fulfillment of Vision 2030. Main architect of that vision is our feature speaker. Please welcome to the podium Dr. The Honorable Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Please welcome him warmly.
Thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you very much. Permit me to acknowledge the presence and association of Dr. the Honorable Nan Gatsby Dolly, our Minister of Education, other members of the cabinet who might be present here with us this evening. Welcome to the Honorable Ansel Dennis, Chief Secretary of the Tobago House of Assembly. Your Worship, the Mayor of Port of Spain, Alderman Joel Martinez, and members of council. The Honorable Lisa Morris Julian, Minister in the Ministry of Education. Senator Hassel Bacchus, Minister in the Ministry of Public Administration and Digital Transformation. Other members of parliament, very special welcome to the most Reverend Charles Jason Gordon, Archbishop of Port of Spain, who must be the most willing Archbishop that I have known. He is never one to say no when he's invited to take part in anything involving nation building. Thank you very much, Archbishop. Ms. Leno Betty Simon, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Education. Ms. Lisa. Henry David, Chief Education Officer. Dr. Freddie James, presenter and panelist here this evening. Staff of the Ministry of Education. Valued stakeholders all in this business of education. Specially invited guests. Members of the media. Members of the viewing and listening public. Distinguished citizens all, particularly any children who might be up and following us at this time. I had a written speech to read tonight because not only did I want to participate in this process, but I wanted to be careful what I said, because it is so easy to be misunderstood uh, these days. But on completion of the speech, I decided that I'd throw it away and use my own existence as the presentation tonight. I would just simply make some references and give you some numbers. But I ask you to pay careful attention to what they represent. Because this business of education, you will see in all of it a connection, a synergy, and maybe a confusion, and always a challenge between what was said so eloquently by Dr. James and the Minister Bacchus and Minister Gatsby Dolly. A lot of what was said, when we begin to look into what was said, you'll see the assignment that we are undertaking. As Prime Minister, I simply want to say to the population that I know, I know what public policy in education means. I am the living example of that. I know what public policy was. And that's why I think I'll just mention a little bit about myself, so that you can understand that I'm not a stranger to this assignment. I grew up with my grandparents in Tobago. And like every other guardian and parents in this country, I know now, if I didn't know then, that they wanted the best for me and that they would do anything to give me the best. Whether it was 25 cents to buy my lunch or spending all the money in the household on my books, I remember 
being running up and down behind my grandfather. And one of the things that stay with me is going with him to a political meeting when I was seven years old. And in those days, it's not like now when you do as you please and just as you want. When there was a political meeting in the village, you had to put on your, my, the adults had to put on your jacket and your felt hat to go to a political meeting. And my grandfather, at, I was seven years old and he took me to this meeting. He was wearing a khaki suit with his felt hat. And Mason Hall is cold, we up on the hill and it's cold and I remember being there and shivering in the outdoors because the wind was blowing kind of cold and pushing my hand down in his jacket to keep warm and looking into the eyes of Uriah Butler that they were like burning diamonds. And he too was talking the very thing we're talking about here tonight, which is that assignment ahead to transform and to change. And my grandparents were supporters of APT James, who was the, 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 the defender of the, what they call the Cutlass and Home Man. And Dr. Williams came and he was speaking but that night in that meeting, I went home and they talked about voting for James. But in 1961, Dr. Williams came and he made a very powerful presentation about education. And when I got back home, my grandmother asked my grandfather, what did Dr. Williams talk about? And my grandfather said, he talked about the boy. Long after I realized what my grandfather was saying to my grandmother was that Dr. Williams is talking about the future that for me personally. One year later, I was in Bishop's High School. And I was the first person in my family to have gone to high school of my, of my siblings. I have five brothers and three sisters, none of whom, well, only my younger sister and myself, we're the only two to have gone to high school. I was the first one, my sister was the second one. And having the opportunity through public policy to go to high school changed the trajectory, not only of my life, but my entire family and the generations to come. It is not that I was any brighter than my siblings. It was just that the opportunity was not there for those who were older than I was. And having gone to high school in that part of the country, rural part of the country, Tobago being rural, Trinidad and Tobago, the whole question of going to university didn't even arise. Because affordability didn't permit it. Opportunity was not there. Those were the days of a few scholarships for a few very fortunate people who got island scholarships. But if you were out there in that part of the orbit, it wasn't there. Again, for me, personally, there was one scholarship available, one, and it was the Sylvan Bowles scholarship available to the top student in that school. The other students had to literally settle for the end of the educational career there, or one or two may be fortunate to have had some opportunity. But there wasn't, there wasn't a basket of scholarships. But as Minister uh, Lisa Murray said, we have had some successes, some of it spectacular, because this boy that Dr. William spoke about that didn't understand what he was really saying. And this entry of the first person in the family into high school, I was there when we took a decision that because Brian Lara made 400 runs and broke that record, that magnificent performance, not just breaking the record, but breaking the record again, 400 runs, that we would as a government, give 400 scholarships. That happened in this country. In two generations, 
we move from no chance to 400 scholarships. And of course, we could have only done that because there was an affordability that was in front of us. The best earning years of this country's history was in the period 2006 to 2008. And we did not think that that trajectory of that curve that was going upward in LNG that was giving us that money that we were putting in the Heritage Fund, we had a surplus in the budget and so on. We didn't think that we, in our time in government, would be in a situation where the change would be so dramatic. Things would have changed. Today, 400 scholarships is a strain. And of course, more importantly, the expectation, unlike my day, when most children in secondary school did not expect to go to university, today, the expectation from virtually every one of them is that we go on to secondary education. And in this country, we're one of the few countries in the world that offer, that sustain, and even guarantee education at the primary, the secondary, and the tertiary level, and much of it for free, a word I don't like to use, but paid for, usually not by the, ben the direct beneficiary. So we are now talking about transforming education. Why? It is because there's a general dissatisfaction, one, that the system is not producing the kind of citizen that we expect from the investment we're making, and two, that we have to take and make use of the opportunities that are available to us as a people, as a nation, if we're going to participate in the world's economy and the world as a whole. We have to transform ourselves. Education is very important and very sensitive to every family, every person, every parent. And therefore, transformation is not going to be an easy process. It's going to be a contentious process. It might even be destructive in the contentions. And that is why if I do one thing tonight, I want to ask the population that as we set about to transform our education system, let us talk about it. Let us argue about the points and the issues. But let us be careful not to let the negative vibes be the outcome. Minister Hasselbacher spoke tonight about outcomes of a process. If the outcome is simply the rara of the noise, then we would have failed. But if the outcome is that we have faced reality and decide that we are going to do what is required, especially for the next generation, that the transformation is an exercise of vigor, an exercise of participation, an exercise of expectation. If we do that, then the next hurdle for Trinidad and Tobago would be easy. But the potential for trouble is there. But the government is not going to shy away from it, because it needs to be done. Free secondary education was not easy for the first PNM government. It was a commitment that had to be funded, that had to be defended. But you know, tonight I want to mention 10 strands in the fabric of that transformation that we are going to have to engage. Strand number one, who gets educated? I think the answer is known to all of us and accepted. There'll be, little, there'll be little confusion there. We are committed to every child in this country to offer him or her an opportunity for a good education. And not only children. Adults can be educated too because a good education system allows continuous education. And I want to put that in the context of a statement that I grew up with my, my, my my good friend and mentor in teaching when I was a little young teacher, I had the privilege of being in the presence of the great Mervyn Elder, that educator. And he used to always tell us, nothing is taught until it's learned. We have that commitment to all our children. I think that is a, a given. The next question 
next thread that we have to hold is where is this teaching going to take place? In the schools, of course. But whose schools? Whose schools? I don't know if you're all aware, but the majority of children in this country get their education in schools that are owned, not by the state that is committed, but the state that supports schools that are owned by other people. Most importantly and most commonly referred to is the next thread. What is the process by which our children will get into these schools? The selection process. Well, in my day, common entrance was it. Broke the door for us. It broke the barrier for us because entrance was not common. Entrance was selective on bases that we don't even want to remember. And that is why it was called common entrance, an entrance which was common to all based on merit. We've forgotten what it was like before that. So when you hear people abusing the phrase common entrance as some murderous arrival, it was liberation. It just changed to SEA, but it was still a principle of selection. So the question is, what is the process? I hear a lot of people very easily talking about changing the SEA to something else. But you never hear the conversation ends with what that something else is going to be. I think it's because the, the, the advocates know that there's going to be contention there. But the time has come for us to bite that bullet, grasp that nettle. There are other systems available in the world. Question is, do we want any of those systems? Can we tolerate any of those systems? Can we fund those systems? Can we accept those systems in a plural society? So if we are talking about changing from SEA, it must be changed to something else. What is the something else? Let that be the conversation. I want to hear that. And I'm anxious to hear what the options are coming from the experts. And the, most, the best experts are the parents, because they are the ones who will determine what happens to their children. Then the next question is, what is taught? What is going to be taught in these schools after this process? What is the curriculum? Are we satisfied with the school's curriculum? There was a time when there were some advocates who wanted to change the school curriculum. And something came to the cabinet that had in it the removal of geography and history as part of the school curriculum. And another colleague of mine and myself behaved very aggressively in the cabinet to make sure that madness didn't happen. But the question that is being asked there is whether the curriculum is preparing and delivering the kind of citizen that the investment deserves. and whether the curriculum is tailored to suit the wide cross-section of differences that make up the population, that cohort of people who would depend on that curriculum to bring um, some balance somewhere. Then the next question is, next thread that you have to weave there, who, who is doing the teaching? I will mention something later on, because I'm sure you don't know. But what I, I, I'll go to some numbers in a little while, and you'll understand why I would be concerned about who is teaching. Because there's an absence, a significant gap, with the presence of male teachers in the school system. I love ladies. I have a wife, I have two daughters, I have a granddaughter. I have, I have nothing against women, contrary to what you hear one or two of them saying. But a school system that is lacking a sufficient presence of the male teacher is a problem. Especially 
and many of her children are without fathers in their homes. And of course, there's a cost to education. Who pays it? How much? And how much can we afford? It's another trap. And then we get into the esoteric. Equity in education. We talk about scholarships you would have heard recently. The cabinet making changes with respect to um, the number of scholarships and the use of bursaries to increase the number of persons who would be supported by the public purse. There's some element of equity that has to be sought after and found to ensure that those who need the help get it and those who can help themselves do so largely without being excluded from the support that the state has to offer. And then the question now is, how much support is there in the budgeting process for this whole question of education, which is so transformational? Transformational to the point where I am sure that in this room here tonight, there isn't a single one of you who either directly or your family was not impacted by the education system in Trinidad and Tobago that made significant change to your family's circumstance. I'm pretty sure. Because our education system in Trinidad and Tobago has offered the opportunity and has impacted virtually every family in this country. And some of the impact has been quite dramatic. And of course, the question of appreciation. Appreciation. Who is responsible for this area of our development? And do they have the national standing that they deserve? Do they get the recognition that they deserve? Are our best teachers where they should be in the education system? Or is it that the best place to be is at the top in the tertiary level where you earn well, the perks are good, because you're bright and you have a PhD. But there's somebody saying that the best teacher should be in the primary school system. And they, the, recompense, the, the compensation there should be, if not as good, but almost as good as those who tell you I'm the first to get a PhD and I'm the first to be a head of history department, I'm the first to be an engineer. But that primary school teacher, that primary school teacher who lays the foundation, it might very well be that as we set about to transform education, we have to transform the levels of appreciation as well. And as I look at this fabric, and talk about the citizen that is the outcome, I could not find a better motto. I could not find better watchwords than the ones that we have. Discipline. Discipline in schools, for schools, and about schools, and about education is a be all and end all. If there is no discipline, we are going to fail. And we require tolerance. Because in this plural society, there are many voices who will respond to change by not facing the mathematical fact or the social demands that is applicable to any of us, but who will only see the process in the eyes of geography, from the country, so I get left out, race, I'm of this race, so the other race take it, religion, and those divisive conversations. In a plural society, those are given. We have to be cognizant of that 
and to control ourselves in this transformation and let the transformation be driven by the purpose. But it requires trust. If there's no trust, those conversations of the negatives could prevail. So, if we look at the country's ability to deliver and its promise to all our citizens, you may find that we go in, you know, fits and starts. In 1991, when we embarked on the production of LNG in this country, in that government of 1991 going forward, that's when LNG came into being, it was the earnings from LNG that allowed us by 2006 up to 2008 to have had the kinds of financial resource to have done a lot of what we had done, which is, you know, fund a big scholarship program, create UTT, expand a number of offerings in the education system, and then it comes crashing down in 2009 with the Wall Street collapse. And we move from the prospect of a, what, what had appeared to be a long period of prosperity because those of us who were geologists in the cabinet, I think there were three or four of us there, we, at the time, we were the uh, main supplier of LNG to the east coast of the United States and some of it to Europe. Nowhere on the horizon was shale gas, which would have made the buying Americans into selling Americans. The Americans are now selling gas into the Caribbean. When we got into LNG, there was no question of us having to compete with. There was no question of gas being cheaper. As a matter of fact, as a trained geologist to the PhD level, nowhere in my training was there any conversation about gas coming from shale, which is a rock that is all over the world, but it was one of those rocks that you'd never look for oil and gas in because of its, 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 its physical condition. By Five years ago, the technology was so good, improved technology, new technology, that those rocks that were never thought to have hydrocarbons, that you can extract it, those rocks are now the major sources of hydrocarbons in the world, being extracted in America to the extent where America has now put itself in a position not to buy from people like us, but to provide it so cheaply at home that the plants that were operating in Trinidad and Tobago were now a bit off in America. So you don't have to buy expensive gas in Trinidad and Tobago. You don't have to transport the finished product from Trinidad and Tobago. You got to put it in a truck and carry it to the farm next door. That's the world. And of course, the market, even before COVID, the cheap gas had driven the market down. And of course, up comes COVID. And the world's economy spiraled downwards in terms of its consumption. Whether it is motor cars on the road, planes in the air, even fertilizers being utilized in the farm, or explosions in Chile for buying ammonia. Our plants, some of them are closed because the market is just not there for the product we produce. That's a change. But in that environment, we are now forced as we must, to transform our education system because we are bent not to be left behind in any world ahead. We have to continue to think that we have a future. I just want to just give you a little, uh, give you some numbers for those of you, especially those of you who are not in the education system, as to what we're dealing with. So when you hear we are talking about our people are talking about education. I want to give you a little idea of the, what, as to what the porcupine is, what, the, what, what, the, what exactly it is. In this country, we have, in the, we have 611 primary and secondary schools. 611. 
of which 384 are government-assisted schools, meaning these are church schools, largely, and government schools, 227. But as government, you know if, the wind, if, if a window is broken in one of these 384 schools, our toilet is not functioning. You know, the minister is responsible for that. So the 611 schools, of which 227 are government, 384 are secondary, are assisted. In terms of teachers, in terms of teachers in the government assisted schools, we have 5,258 teachers in the government schools, 1,920. So out of a total of 7,178 teachers, 5,258 are in the government assisted schools. Now the policy of the government funding those teachers is a policy that should not go unnoticed. These are teachers, ask yourself, what would have been the situation had the government not had a policy of funding these teachers in these government assisted schools? And of course, many of these government assisted school owners would not have been in a position to conduct schools in the way they're being conducted now because they did not and would not have had the financial resources to fund teachers on that scale and in that way. With respect to male and female teachers in the primary and secondary schools, we got 6,728 teachers, of which only 1,405 are male. 5,323 are females. So much of the teaching load is on our female teachers. In some schools, there is nobody to play cricket with the boys. There's nobody to stand in and let boys be boys. Some of the female teachers are playing that role. And I think that has to do largely with the better performance of our female population in the education system. But I think some rectification is required. We need to encourage more men. We need to encourage more men into the school halls, into the school rooms, if we are going to balance the education of our children. And of course, if you look in the primary schools, in the government and government assisted schools, in the primary school system, where there's 69, 78 teachers, only 1,334 of those in the primary schools are men, that foundational aspect of it. In total, primary and secondary schools, 13,906 teachers, 10,000 female, 3,300, 10,500 female, 3,300 male. So, with respect to the student population in the government and government assisted schools, primary schools, 123,000. Secondary schools, 84,800. And the total, 208,000. In the government schools, primary, we have 58,000 students there, 18,000 females, 20,000 males. So while we have more male students in the primary school, we have a small fraction of male teachers. 20,000 in primary schools, boys is about 18,000 girls, and you see what's going on there. In secondary schools, we said the government schools, 56,000 students, 28,000 boys, 
27,000 girls, once again, you see, slight majority of boys, but without the male teachers. Primary and secondary schools, 94,000 in total, with the boys at 50,000, the girls at 45,000 plus. In the government assisted schools, in the primary schools, 84,000, of which roughly 42,269 girls, 42,689 boys. In the secondary schools, 28,000, 15,000 girls, 12,900 boys. In the government, and, and, and I'll give you the total of that a while ago, 208,000 of them there. Now, those are the people who are usually referred to when we speak about education, but we do have a number of other, we have uh, five and a half thousand children in ECC, in the public centers, in the private centers, 21,000 students, and uh, in the special schools, we have 12 of them, and we have a total of, uh, in special schools, 552 students there, government assisted, 414, and in the straight government, 138. Now, at the tertiary level, this is where the big box are. On the campus at UWI, we have 11,270 undergrads, 5,079 for an enrollment of 16,349. And that is a big jump in the last decade. Eh? And to maintain that main campus, that's a cost of $581 million. And the cabinet is under severe pressure to increase that to allow the university to do what they think they need to do. We're having great difficulty saying to the university, we can, we'll try to make this 589, 81, but we, don't, we can't commit to any increase at this time. At Mount Hope, which is also a teaching facility, that's a $15 million commitment there. And the medical science complex, yeah, another 20 million. UTT, arising out of the days of prosperity, 2006 on, 180 million. Costat, 95 million. Put all that together, and you're looking at 890 odd million, almost 900 million dollars. And that's every 12 months. It's not when you pay it, you finish paying it. It's required to be paid every 12 months. So you could imagine now that the revenues are as constricted as they are, how difficult it is for the Minister of Finance to find that check, which is doing it two or three times a year, of about three or four hundred million dollars to go there. Then, of course, we have the technical and vocational educational training. Because sometimes the conversation does not take them into account as though they don't exist. But at MIC, that's the 49 million. YTEP, 38.7 million. NESC, 9 million. Hype, 12 million. Must, 12 million. Serval, 19 million. Another 8 million in help. And we're talking here about. Uh, $147 million. And of course, we have 14 campuses for work there, and YTEP has 45 locations in the country. And of course, I can't leave here without mentioning a gate, which, like UTT, came about when we thought that we could have um, provided that opportunity for as wide a cross-section of people as possible, because that commitment is there to educate and to liberate. But in 2014, GATE was $3.8 billion in a national budget of $65 billion, 5.9%. I 
um, sorry, no, I'm, I'm speaking here, not here. This is the, the Ministry of Education, sorry. Total, total allocation. That's a total allocation, not gate. A total allocation to the ministry. 3.8 billion out of a budget of 65 billion. By 2016, that allocation was 6.2 billion out of a budget of 56 billion, 11.1%. 11 .1 so the commitment in terms of the support and the sacrifice that we're making for education, we were putting 11% in in 2016, even as we were recognizing that the national budget was shrinking down from 65 billion to 56 billion. By 2018, it was 5.5 billion in a budget of 54 billion, 10.2%. Still, education holding our attention and the country keeping that commitment. But by 2020, the budget is now 58 billion, much of it from borrowed money. Much of it from borrowed money. You may recall the budget deficit. 5.8 billion, education is still 10 billion, 10 percent. Okay. I give you these numbers so that you will know that in Trinidad and Tobago, there is an abiding commitment across all governments since 1956 to now, regardless of our economic circumstances. And that is something that this country should be proud of. It is that investment that allows us to be who we are and even to be alive today. You would have seen the performance of our health sector in Trinidad and Tobago. Nobody sets about to build a fire station during a fire. When COVID visited us in January 2020, that was no time to begin talking about training doctors in public health care and virology and epidemiology and so on and so on and so on. It was to call upon an investment that we have committed to. Unfortunately, this country was in a position to get the answer that we got. I mentioned GATE. In 2004, GATE started with 102 million. So put $100 million in this program and allow people to go and get themselves um, educated at tertiary level. It was grasped with both hands and a few toes. By 2008, which is the, uh, the year of the largest amount of money ever earned by this country, GATE was $574 million. Five times more than the initial amount that we started out with. And by 2011, by the time you add the waste and the whatever, GATE was running at $757 million. And by the time we got to 2012, it was $720 million. And of course, we did some reviews, and we did some pruning, and we removed some waste and so on. And we tailored the programs in some ways, making it a little more practically uh, useful. By 2016, serving 46,000 students as against 19,000 in the first year, GATE was costing 485 million. And by 2018, 435, and this year, 2020, 433. In short, in that period, 2004, that 16 year period, this country spent eight and a quarter billion dollars on the GATE program. And who were the beneficiaries of that program? Households or applicants whose income level was 1,000 to 8,999, 
between one and nine thousand dollars a month. They made up sixty percent of the people who access GATE. Think of that as a social program. And ask yourself, how many of those people or those households would have had that opportunity had this program not been part of the public policy? 60% of that, of the, best, of the beneficiaries came from that household. Households between $9,000 and $19,000, they represented 31% of the beneficiaries. 19,000 and 25,000 a month, 4.5 percent, and over 25,000, 3.6 percent. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot that we can be proud of. There's a lot that we have to do. There's a lot that we must do. These conversations, these spotlight events, the activities of the Ministry of Education, now, I presume into 2021. They are meant to cause us to focus on who we are, what we are doing, and what we should be doing. So that the next generation, there should be people who would have benefited as fundamentally changed as I was, and as I'm sure many of you here were also changed by public policy in education. I trust that you will continue to participate. I trust that the parents will continue to give priority to their children's education. And I trust that our teachers will continue to see their calling as sacred and vocational. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prime Minister. As we continue with our program, we have a dance item. As you've been seeing, our entertainment is being provided by our youngsters, our talented youth. 14 years old is our dancer, and his name is Christian Rohit Samuel. He hails from Coover East Secondary School. Please welcome him now. Don't 
Thank you very much to young Christian Rohit Samuel. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the period where we will have our panel coming up on stage. So I invite the Prime Minister, the Minister of Education, Senator Bacchus, Dr. James, if you would please uh, take your seats on stage and we look forward to interaction from our audience here at Napa. To those who are online, many of whom may perhaps uh, have to switch off from the feed, we would like to thank you for your participation, of course, in this session, Transforming Education. So now our panelists will delve a bit further into what we've heard from the digital transformation of education for those who need to ask more questions about perhaps what needs to be done with the curriculum. Any questions that we might have. The Ministry of Education did have um, a request sent out to teachers and other stakeholders in education and we do have some of those questions. So in between the questions from our live audience we would uh, of course, ask of our panelists their answers to some of the questions that came online. So we do have ushers uh, in the audience who will come to you. All protocols are being observed, all COVID-19 protocols, uh, so that everything will be sanitized. We ask that you keep on your masks in the audience, and that you give your name, your organization, if you're representing an organization, and to whom the question is going to be addressed. So um, I am Sharon Pitt. For those who are just joining us either online or on TTT or any of the other platforms. So could we please have our first question, if you'd stand so that the ushers could come to you. So questions from the audience, please. Yes, sir. Good evening to the Honourable Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, and the Honourable Minister of Education, Dr. Nian gatsby Dolly, and to the other members of the panelists. I am Lance Motley, the President of the National Primary School Principals Association. I am heartened to hear the conversation here this evening. I heard Dr. Rowley, and I think it was uh, Dr. James as well, who also who spoke about uh, a radical change and not being afraid to be frank in this kind of conversation that we are talking about, the national con consultation. So I want to offer some frank, two frank conversations or two pieces of discussions that I know can evoke some kind of contention, but the Prime Minister is saying that, you know, we are open to these kinds of conversations. And so when we're talking about transformation, we, there's a whole gamut of issues that we can talk about. But I don't want to talk about two particular issues. One, we need to talk about how schools are funded, particularly small government primary schools. The current system is wasteful. It is inefficient, and it is not reaching the targets that it is supposed to reach. So I'm making a special appeal to Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley and to the Minister of Education Dr. Nian gatsby Dolly, that some great effort is being made to address the issue of funding. Now when we talk to the technocrats, they will tell you things like, for instance, it was one of the things handed down by God and the, the Ten Commandments. I don't believe that. 
I believe that the regulations and the policies surrounding how schools are funded, those were written by people. It was written by government. And if there is any real effort to change it, it means, therefore, that there must be some will on the part of those who are responsible for constructing these policies. There must be a will. And I want to say, we talk, if we're talking about transformation or transforming education, if we do not address this critical issue of how schools are funded, then we would have missed the mark. The other issue I want to talk about, again, again, there's a whole gamut, and I will leave room for other people to, 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 to mention the others. But we need to talk about the selection process of staff. We talk about leadership. We know that leadership is extremely critical to the success of any organization. And if we are talking about molding and shaping our nation's children, it is even more critical. And so therefore, I want to make a special appeal that principals be given the opportunity, as, is, as does happen in, in the um, denominational schools, and to a large extent in the denominational schools of secondary schools, it happens there. If we're talking about transforming education and having the kind of transformation we're talking about and having kind of the impact that we want going forward in the 21st century, then principals must play a critical role in the selection process of those persons who will compose the staff. You're talking about male teachers and, 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 and so on. We need to have principals being part of that process. And of course, in evaluating that question, we may need to ask ourselves the question, is the Teaching Service Commission valid today? Thank you. Lance, uh, that is for the Prime Minister. Yes. <laughs> I, was, I was so engrossed, are you hearing me? Yeah. You can take off. Yeah. I was so engrossed in the uh, contribution that I forgot that I was a panelist. <laughs> I simply want to say that those three issues, he said two, but there were three issues there, might be among the top ten in the hit period of transforming education in this country. And if we start with the, first, the last one first, that is a question that hits right at the heart of the country's constitution. And I, the way he put it, I, I, I put it back to you all, is the Teaching Service Commission valid in today's exercise? It might have been the answer at the time when it came into being. Those service commissions came into being in the in context of protection of the population. I could posit now that after 50 years, it might very well be that they're not protecting the population, they're obstructing the population. But these are political matters that may be weightier than the political environment is capable of. Clearly, I just mentioned to you that um, number of thousands of teachers that we have. A part-time service commission certainly cannot satisfactorily service that large number of teachers. And secondly, the role, the managerial role that is required for that population of teachers to be properly, effectively managed, cannot be dispensed in the management model that exists now. That's, it's as simple as that. But whether we can change it is another story. But whether it needs changing, the answer, I think, is yours. With respect to the funding of schools, these are public service, um, how should I put it? It's, the answers you usually get is that that's how it used to, that's how it is, that's how it used to be, that's how it was being done, and therefore, the public service is a very difficult animal to keep on a straight line. When 
you try to make change. Because the change is usually rooted either in law or in practice. And the practitioners usually invoke the law when you infer or require change. But it is something that the minister and her team will have to look at. And if there are proposals to be made to the cabinet and the government has the wherewithal to make the changes, then I think this is all part of the transformation we're looking for. And I'm happy that um, the, the spokesperson is in the primary school system. And I personally believe that a lot of changes are required at the primary school level and we build from the bottom up rather than try to build from the top down. Staff selection, I believe he asked about that. Oh, this, the selection of teachers. That's a new one and it's an interesting one. Again, I leave that wide open. What is the role? I mean, managers on the factory floor have a say in choosing people who operate the factory. You can't just go and hand a manager all kind of people in the factory, they'll burn down the place. And I think that is one of the things that would probably contribute. Because while we can say glowing things for a lot of teachers, um, the selection of some teachers might have been a mistake in some cases. And if that is so and they're identified, and if there are systems that could prevent uh, the, the, the less inclined, to be selected and the more inclined. Because teaching, like farming, you have to like it. You have to want to do it. It's a vocation. It's not easy. But you, you, you got those people like nursing. You, you have to want to be there, to be a good nurse. You have to want to give care. And you have to want to impart knowledge and to uh, instill discipline and to become, a, you, you are in front of people as an exemplar as a, a role model continuously. You want to do that. And those are the people who should be, who I presume would impress the principals if they are uh, being given the opportunity to choose. And there's a big difference between certification and aptitude. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, any questions, other questions with the usher, please? The gentleman in the back who stood. Good. <coughs> Yeah, good evening, Mr. Prime Minister and all at the head table. My name is Kenneth Surratt. I am the Executive Officer of the Blind Welfare Association and also Commissioner on the Equal Opportunity Commission. You started out, Mr. Prime Minister, that nothing is taught until it is learned, and I love that statement very, very much. And I also want to thank the Minister of Education, because we were having some challenges for 20 children at the School for Blind to get their laptops. And I simply text her, she intervened and the matter was solved. So my question is, we have children who are blind in the school system and they learn through touch. But because of a virtual classroom, they only have the option of hearing because they cannot see. What plans does the government or the Ministry of Education have to reach these children who learn through touch? Our suggestion is if consideration could be given to just certain time of the week in, uh, in a hybrid system where children could come and learn through touch because they must learn concepts. How do they learn rows and columns? Talking about it wouldn't help. They must be able to touch something to identify. How will they learn what is a square or a circle if they don't touch it? Describing it alone wouldn't help. We need to use the postal service also where we could get tactile items to these children. And a lot of time people feel that teaching children who are blind through touch is a little bit of children. But not every child in the school system will are uh, visual learners. And most of the time when something is created for the blind, even sighted people benefit. And I use an example of the remote. It was not invented for everyone. It was invented for persons who couldn't get up from the couch, set to turn on the television. Now everybody uses it. So Mr. Prime Minister, I'm happy to have this opportunity 
please do not leave our children who are blind behind. If you do that, they will have to keep making basket and stretching their hand for a disability grant. Please, I'm begging, I'm pleading to all everyone here in this room, give our children who are blind that opportunity to learn so they can become whatever they want to become in this world. Thank you very much, Mr. Premier, for listening. Sarah, good to see you. Let me just indicate that our remote or home-based learning system that is operating now is not ideal. There is no education sector in the world that intends to teach ECCE level primary and secondary school children only remotely. The best mix is a blended mix where you incorporate technology, but because of the situation with COVID-19, where we were aiming to get blended so that students would have some face-to-face -face interaction, because of the trajectory of the pandemic, we were forced to take this approach, as was schools all over the world. So what we are aiming to get back to, and it ties back to the Prime Minister's appeal about how we manage ourselves during the pandemic, what we are aiming to get back to is a phased, face-to-face -face reopening of our schools. That's where we need to get, so that we get back to the point where not only the visually impaired or children in special schools, our examination students, our little ones who were just learning to read when school would have closed, they can all get back to the interaction needed with the teachers. That's where we want to go. So, Mr. Surratt, we hear you. And again, we make the appeal to our citizens to have a responsible Christmas season because our children need to get back to school. So what you're saying there is recognized, understood, and that is where we are heading. So this remote and home-based learning is the best we can do in this moment, at this time for our children. And we are doing our best to make it as quality as possible, as accessible as possible. But this is not the gold standard for education. What we want to get to, back to face-to-face, -to -face, incorporating technology so that our students have the best preparation for the world that they live in now. Thank you, Dr. Mian Gadsby. Dolly. Let me just add. Right sure, we will have uh, an addition from Senator Backers. I've been told that we have to wrap up our panel discussion, sadly, in the next five minutes. So we'll probably have uh, one more question. If you would keep it short and sharp, we'd appreciate that. Thank you very much, Senator yes, Backers. Just to add to that, that the, one of the things that technology does, in, in the case of, of of the, the unsighted the, and you need the feel, that's one thing. But for students with other disabilities, the technology really helps in that case. Because not just in, in, the, in, this, in the learning aspect of things, but in their general lives in, in general. So we're going to continue to develop new pieces of technology to aid in the, the way in which we educate all our children with disabilities, not just uh, ones with them. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, sir? Thank you. Hi, good evening to everyone, the honorable members of the panel and the esteemed room here today. My name is Warren Anderson. I am the president of the Guild of Students of UB St. Augustine campus. And uh, my question is directed to the honorable minister of education. We have two pecul peculiar, peculiar situations in undergrad and postgrad. One where GATE is only covering one undergrad program. And um, the certificates are counted as an undergrad program. And persons are curious, what happens to me when I am seeking entry into the BSc program? and I have successfully completed my certificate, the situation is usually that, you know I'm granted entry into the BSc program, no, that will not be so. People are sort of reeling from the, the news because there's a lot of hope in getting into the BSc program. I'm sure everybody understands, you know, the, the, the merit in getting into the BSc to better your situation at home. 
The other situation in post-grad is that we are very grateful for the extension into August 2021. However, there are some people that will not complete their programs within the year. These persons would have rationalized that coming out of secondary school and into tertiary education is a seamless process. So they will not have the work experience, etc. Some may not even be able to access the help loan based on their circumstance. So they are looking forward, at least the ones who have the two-year programs, to complete their programs. So we're asking the Guild of Students, how will the ministry treat with these persons, the certificate persons, and those who will not complete their postgraduate programs by August 2021? Thank you. I think what we're experiencing at this time is what will obtain once a policy shift is made. There will be persons who would have, on the basis of the existing policy at the time, made certain decisions, and when the policy changes, they will be affected. This is something that is regrettable, but it is the situation that we face now. So whereas students may have been going to the certificate method and then heading towards their BSc, some students would have made a decision to come out of secondary school where the A-levels would have been free and affordable to pursue a different program and make a different entry into the BSc level. At this point, that is where we are. We are at the point, and you would have heard the Prime Minister explain about our financial situation. At no point does anybody want to disadvantage or not offer an opportunity. But when you're faced with the financial reality, then you are at the point where you have to make a decision to allow for as many people as possible to be assisted. So that is the situation. So those who are doing, who have now started, they would have the year, yes, but in the, in the second year of their study, they would have to make available some funding. The help loan is still available, and um, that is something that we are looking at to determine if we can assist those who have problems getting a guarantor. So all of those things we are looking to see within the set policy how we can assist those who may have particular problems to access the help loan, because that is available um, at low cost and interest from the government, and that's a way to assist you to fund your studies. And I can tell you, when I was a student at UWE, there was no gate. So I am someone who had to go through the help loan process. Again, issues on getting a guarantor. It wasn't easy to get a guarantor, and that is why we are looking at the possibility of assisting students who find difficulty finding the guarantor to even assist to that extent. And so I went through that process, um, had to get the loan for my degree, and then had to pay it back when I started to work. So I understand what it is to a student to have to fund your education in that way, and I was grateful for the assistance of the HELP loan, and we will do our best to make that facility as accessible as possible for those who need to access it. Thank you, Dr. Gadsby Dolly. Quick one, please. We have uh, just a couple minutes. Greetings to the esteemed panel. My name is Beryl Jofield. I am the president of the Executive Student Guild for the National University of Trinidad and Tobago, UTT. Um, my question, as quick as possible, will be, um, is there any consideration by the government for any particular program that may be considered essential that will be considered for any um, easier access towards additional funding or gate funding for any students who are willing to study maybe in the areas of agriculture mm. or sports or any other program that might be considered essential by the government. Secondly, I would like to ask, during this entire consultation, were there any consideration outside of what has been done or in this panel to consult with any tertiary level student organization or any other student body for the decisions made in transforming education? Answering your question, the last part first, this is an ongoing process. It is the intention of the government um, that the ministry and its uh, agencies 
will keep this conversation going and there'll be adequate and frequent consultation with all the stakeholders. What we've done here is initiate a process and the process is underway. Um, you would have been invited to this event um, at relatively short notice, about a week or two ago, and we're here tonight and we are ongoing. You'll be invited again and we'll be coming to you. With respect to the, what's the first part again? The Any special. program. You, you mentioned um, particular funding for yes, particular areas. Well, uh, yes, I'm glad you mentioned that because in working with this uh, situation, I was amazed at the range of offerings that the national programs were carrying. I did not believe the figure. I had to ask the minister to double check. I thought it was a mistake. What was it, 2,500? 2,500 different subjects, programs. Oh. Now, that may be okay when everything is available and we were not under strain. But in a situation where the last thing that we want is to incur expenses that we cannot discharge. The, the, the adjustments that you're hearing about and the cutbacks that you're hearing about, they are meant to ensure and it's, even so, it's still difficult that when we incur the expenses, whether it is scholarship programs, whether it is staff on, on, on the university and so on, that the bills can be paid. Because if you accept more responsibility than you can discharge, that will be a new conversation. And when we accept that we are not as well off as we used to be, and that the prospect of being as well off as we were are not immediately in front of us. We just have to face reality and come to the conclusion that at this point in time, given the resource base that we're using, that 2,500 programs or, or um, subjects might not be absolutely necessary. We have to trim it down and of course, in doing so, some programs will have to fall by the wayside in the support basket. Not that they would not be studied by some people, but they will do so outside of the state support. And certainly the ones that contribute the most to national and personal development are the ones that will make that hit period. Thank you, Prime Minister. As was just mentioned, we are going, I'm sure, to have further consultations and conversations. Apologies to all those who submitted questions that we have not been able to get to this evening. Uh, but uh, as we say, those should be addressed and there'll be chances for further conversations. Of course, at this time, it's up to, it's my pleasure to invite the Prime Minister to give closing remarks on this uh, spotlight on education. Thank you very much. Sharon, and I want to be very, I'll be very short. We had intended to finish a little earlier than this, but we, are, we went a little over. So I want to apologize for that and to thank all of you for putting this together and for coming here. You get a special thank you from the Office of the Prime Minister and the Office of the Minister of Education and all our support staff. This, I expect, would be one of many and hopefully um, our health conditions would be such that maybe later on we can gather in larger numbers and make the format a little different where you, the audience, can carry the conversation because in the short period of uh, the panel discussion's existence, some really fundamental issues were raised and I think they will serve to alert the population as to what is in front of us. The Ministry of Education would be during the existence of this administration taking steps to treat with the issues as raised, which are insufficient funding, the hardships being dealt with by some of our special students, some of our students who were in programs that had to be tailored and, and pruned. So all of these make up the work program of the Ministry of Education during this period of 2020-21 going forward. We expect that you too will believe that our future is bright and that we have a future and that all of this is planning 
to make that future bright and to give all of us a future. So I just want to say thank you all and stand by for further discussions. And those of you who were not here at Napa this evening and you were home, next time, sometime in the not too distant future when we meet again, and I'm sure that um, special thanks would be uh, warranted for the media who would carry what we have tried to do here this evening. And those of you who didn't participate directly, I'm sure that you will prepare yourselves to do so because this is an ongoing process in an ongoing program. And at the end of the day, we expect that there is no mountain that we wouldn't be able to climb and no hurdle that we will not be able to fall. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. We would request of you that you allow the Prime Minister and his party to exit the Annapa Auditorium.